Hi, I'm Kimber Scavo. I'm the group leader of the State and Local Programs Group in the Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards. Today I'm going to give an overview of air quality management, the National Ambient Air Quality Standards process, and how the state implementation plans are required for the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. Let's start with the overall air quality management process. Air quality management is a system that combines emissions data, air quality information, promulgation of rules and regulations to meet the goals and requirements set forth in the Clean Air Act. The Clean Air Act prescribes a complicated set of requirements and responsibilities based upon collaborative working relationships among EPA, state and tribal, and local agencies. Air quality management components include setting the NACs, designing and implementing state implementation plans or SIPs, and control strategies to comply with the NACs. It also assesses and measures the progress of air quality. SIPs are the framework to provide for control strategies that achieve the NACs. This flowchart shows the individual components of how the air quality management system operates. It begins by setting a NACs and ends with SIP implementation. It can be a continuous process. If you would like more detailed information on how the AQM process operates, please refer to the presentation by Marcia Spink. The first step in the AQM process is for the EPA to set the NACs. The setting of the NACs requires substantial scientific and technical information. The Clean Air Act directs the US EPA to identify and set national standards for pollutants with adverse public health and environmental effects. The Clean Air Act also requires EPA to review each standard at least once every five years. EPA has established NACs for six criteria pollutants, ozone, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, lead, and particulate matter. So what is the process for setting the NACs? First, the agency reviews the latest available science. This includes evaluation and integration of the latest peer-reviewed science. It also includes a policy assessment, which is based on the science assessment, including air quality exposure and risk assessments. The Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee is established to review air quality criteria and also to give recommendations to the administrator of any new standards and revision of existing criteria and standards as may be appropriate. We also have a peer and public review of science and policy process where the public gets a chance to review and provide comments. Health-based standards are requisite to protect public health with an adequate margin of safety. Public health policy judgments are required to protect sensitive groups, not the most sensitive individual, from adverse effects. The standards are not risk-free and they are not based on cost. Welfare-based standards are required to protect agricultural crops and ecosystems from adverse effects. EPA typically sets secondary standards the same as primary standards. This flowchart demonstrates the steps EPA takes in setting an X. It takes into account the process outlined in the previous slides. We have NACs for these six criteria pollutants. If you look in the column for ozone, you'll notice three different standards. The 0.12 one hour ozone standard was issued in 1979. And after EPA issued the 0 0.08 eight hour standard in 1997, EPA revoked the one hour standard. Although the one hour standard was revoked, anti backsliding provisions preserved certain obligations under that standard. This schedule shows our current dates for reviewing the NACs. The lead NACs was just finalized in December 2008. At this point, I would like to turn it over to Rhea Jones to discuss the designations process and the regional Hayes program. Hi, my name is Rhea Jones, and I'm the group leader for the Geographic Strategies Group in the Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards. Today, I'll be covering air quality designations process as well as requirements for addressing air pollution that is transported from state to state and requirements to protect visibility in national class one areas. Let's start with air quality designations. Once a new NACS is promulgated, EPA is responsible for determining if an area's air quality meets the standard. We do this using air quality monitoring data, information received from states, 
technical analyses, and other factors to assess air quality against the standard. This is called designations. Specifically, the Clean Air Act under Section 107D requires that within a year of promulgating a new or revised NAAQS by EPA that governors of each state shall submit to EPA a list of all areas or portions thereof in the state recommending they be designated as non-attainment, attainment, or unclassifiable. I'll explain what these terms mean in a moment. The Clean Air Act requires that if EPA intends to modify these state recommendations, we must notify states and tribes no later than 120 days prior to final designations. EPA is required to make final designations no later than two years after the promulgation of a new or revised next, but we may take up to one additional year if we have insufficient information to finalize the designations. A non-attainment area is any area that does not meet or contributes to ambient air quality in a nearby area that does not meet the NAAQS for a given pollutant. Attainment, therefore, means that an area has air quality that meets the NAAQS. When an area is designated as unclassifiable, this means there is insufficient data to determine the air quality status for an area. Here is an example of a spatial analysis of non-attainment areas. This is for the 1997 8-hour ozone NAAQS and designations are complete for this standard. EPA provides guidance on how designations will be done each time a new or revised NAAQS is promulgated. This guidance will typically provide information on the timeline for completing the designations process, years of data that could be considered for designations purposes, and presumptions for boundaries for non-attainment and relevant factors that could be considered in designations decisions. Here is a listing of the most recent designations guidance for the latest NACs. In addition to this guidance, states are encouraged to work closely with their EPA regional office during the designations process. States are also responsible under the Clean Air Act for addressing air pollution that is transported from sources in one state to another and could negatively impact air quality in the other state. This is called interstate transport of air pollution and it is regulated under Section 110A2D of the Act. The Act requires that states, in their 110 infrastructure SIPs, must include adequate provisions to prohibit any source from emitting any air pollutant in amounts which will contribute significantly to non-attainment areas in other states, interfere with maintenance of a NAAQS in other states, interfere with measures to prevent significant deterioration of air quality in other states, and interfere with measures to protect visibility in other states. Recognizing that interstate transport of air pollution is a complex issue, the EPA has promulgated regulations, where appropriate, to help with regional air pollution transport. Examples of these rules include the NOx SIP call, the Clean Air Interstate Rule, and the Regional Haze Rule, which takes us into the next program. Regional Haze is addressed under the Clean Air Act, Section 169A. The Act sets forth as a national goal the prevention of future and the remedying of existing impairment of visibility in mandatory Class I federal areas where the impairment results from man-made air pollution. Class I areas include some national parks and wilderness areas like the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. This park has some of the worst visibility conditions in the country, with a major part attributable to man-made air pollution. Here is a map of mandatory Class I areas. There are 156 Class I areas, mostly located in the West. The Regional Haze Rule, promulgated in 1999, lays out the requirements for meeting the national goal set out in the Clean Air Act. Its intent is to improve visibility over a 60-year time frame in Class I areas to make progress toward natural visibility conditions by the year 2064. The Regional Haze Rule requires that states submit plans, called SIPs, putting in place enforceable measures to reduce air pollution that impacts visibility. These SIPs must be done every 10 years, and states must reassess if additional measures are needed to achieve further progress. States are also required, as part of this SIP, to assess retrofit controls for older large stationary sources, including large power plants, and require them, as appropriate, to reduce pollutants that contribute to visibility impairment. This is called Best Available Retrofit Technology, or BART. The first round of regional hay SIPs were due from all states on December 17, 2007. Many states missed the deadline, and EPA issued formal findings of failure to submit SIPs to these states. This finding turned on the required two-year FIP clock. Therefore, 
EPA must issue FIPS for these states if they do not submit SIPs by January 2011. As I mentioned earlier, a comprehensive SIP revision is due every 10 years, while an interim progress report is due from each state every five years, demonstrating that the state is making reasonable progress toward attaining natural visibility conditions by 2064. Now, Kimber Scavo will discuss projected NACs review and implementation schedules. Here are the projected NACs and implementation schedules together. The chart includes initial designation dates for all pollutants, as well as due dates for the attainment demonstrations and the corresponding attainment dates. As you can see by the schedule, following our five-year NACs review process for all six pollutants results in a very ambitious implementation schedule. Many states are taking steps toward multi-pollutant planning. EPA has promulgated two major ozone implementation rules. In April of 2004, we promulgated our final rule to implement the 8-hour ozone NACs, otherwise known as our Phase 1 rule. In November of 2005, we promulgated our final rule, also known as the Phase 2 implementation rule. In January of 2009, EPA proposed a rule that addresses Subpart 1 reclassifications and anti-backsliding provisions in response to a court decision. EPA is working on additional implementation rules to meet the 8-hour ozone NACs. EPA has promulgated several implementation rules for the other criteria pollutants. On July 15, 2009, EPA proposed the primary NACs for nitrogen dioxide. Information concerning implementation for the proposed NO2 NACs is contained in the proposed rule. For SO2, EPA is in the process of reviewing the NACs and plans on proposing the implementation rule with the NACs in November of 2009. For additional information on designations, regional haze, criteria pollutants and the NACs, and implementation rules, please refer to the websites listed on the screen.